in. It's like two different days, isn't it? The, the weather has totally changed. Um, let me give you a few announcements before we start. Um, uh, prayer meeting is on this week, uh, as usual, 7 p.m. If you need any details for it, please let us know. Also, um, Marion Morgan's funeral is tomorrow at 11 a.m. at the Creme. Um, she was a member here for a long, long time. She was 100, and she was nearly going 101, wasn't she? Yeah, well, well it would be the next year long, wouldn't it? So she lived a long, a long life full of years, isn't it? Um, and, yeah, that's all the announcements for just now, is it? Yeah. Excellent. Let me please welcome you with this verse, um, Jeremiah 32, verse 41. It says this. Um, and this is the Lord speaking. I will rejoice in doing them good and will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. Um, is it just uh, think about that. You know, as a welcome to you this evening, the commitment of the Lord, that doing you good, his whole heart and soul is in it. I don't know about you, when you're doing a job, isn't it? When you're doing something, you're working on a project or whatever, um, you can tell the difference, isn't it, when somebody's heart and soul's not in it. And all the more, isn't it, when it comes to relationships, isn't it, that when the heart and soul is not there, you know? And the Lord says, not only is my heart in this, but his very being, who the Lord is, his soul, his heart, his soul is in doing you good uh, this evening. So let him do you good. And we know what that means, sometimes doing us good, isn't it? Where he's going to bring us from, how he's going to help us. We've got to trust him. Um, but please, this evening, trust him. Let him welcome you with that verse, that you know his heart towards you. His plans are not to hurt you. Um, not to harm you, but to do you good. And I know that he sometimes has to bring out a difficult situations, the sin that you're in, the, the wickedness that you've found yourself in, that the Lord can bring out all these things and, and rescue you. Um, John's going to come and pray with us now. Um, yeah. like personal magnetism. Let's pray. Gracious and almighty Father, you find us gathered together here this evening to praise and worship your holy name and to give you thanks that whilst we were still sinners, you sent the Lord Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, to sacrifice himself for us. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to say those words from that song. While when we were lost, you came and you rescued us. We pray, Lord, if there are any here this evening who as yet cannot in sincerity say that, we pray that by the power of your Spirit you would soften their hearts, you would open their spiritual eyes, that they too might see that truth and come to call to you for rescue, to call to you for salvation. And we pray, Lord, for the proclamation of your word this evening. We pray that you would pour out your Spirit upon Matt as he proclaims it, that it would be proclaimed with your power and your authority. And we pray, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit upon us, that we would not just be hearers, but we would listen and we would apply it to our lives, that we, we might be living witnesses to those around us of your great love for us. And so we ask you, Lord, to bless our gathering in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Um, we're going to watch a short video just now. It's, as a church, we read the Bible together. We're in 1 Kings. This video, short video of just giving you an overview um, of 1 Kings. It's not everything, so please read it and, and get all you can from it. But we're going to watch it now. day everyone and as a church we read the Bible together we call it RBT for short and this month we're in the book of 1 Kings and what a book it is you see right at the beginning David is dying his other son Solomon who's been called by God to be king 
Um, you would think it'd be a straightforward process that Solomon would be handed the reins of kingship, but there's a problem that comes in between. And that problem is David's other son, Adonijah. Adonijah is filled with pride and he wants to step in the gap as he sees his dad dying. And Adonijah says, I will be king. And he puts himself forward and he takes loads of people and he tries by force uh, to be king. Later he tries it in seduction, but ultimately it fails. God finds him out as God always finds us out and Adonijah is killed and Solomon does get to sit on the throne just as the Lord prescribed. And we know that all the plans of the Lord cannot be thwarted, isn't it? And Solomon, although he looks like Jesus in his reign, he's not Jesus. And he, he realized that in order to govern God's people, he needs God's help. And he prays and asks for wisdom. And the Lord answers that prayer and gives him massive insight that is just beyond so much uh, of his own natural strength. And Solomon writes 3,000 Proverbs. It says 1,005 songs. He writes the, the book of Proverbs. He writes uh, Song of Songs. He writes Ecclesiastes. So you see how God answers the, the prayer. And he, what does he do with that um, wisdom? Just like Jesus, he administrates justice. And it says that the people were happy under the rain. So you can see again how it, it all looks like Jesus. And that also it says that the people were living in safety, each one under their own vine. And with that wisdom that God had given him, he was building a temple. And the Lord says to Solomon, if you will follow me, and you continue to follow me, I will live amongst my people. I will not abandon my people. And amazingly, the ark of God is brought to the temple. There's sacrifice. In fact, there's so much sacrifice. So many animals are sacrificed. They can't even be counted. And it's a picture of Jesus' death on the cross. That there's so much help and grace from that sacrifice. There's glory. And then there's prayer. Then there's repentance, then there's forgiveness, and then there's healing. And Solomon prays to the Lord, and the Lord says, My name will be here. But he also warns them and says, But if you go after other gods, it's going to bring destruction. And this is the moment where we say, Yeah, Solomon looks like Jesus, but he's not Jesus. And now Solomon starts not to look like Jesus. And Solomon had a problem. He loved many foreign women. In fact, the Bible says that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And the Lord told them, they're going to turn your heart away. And surely they did. As Solomon grew older, they turned his heart away. He began to build altars to other gods and burn incense to other gods. And it was like his heart was divided a thousand times. And then it says this killer words, Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord and the Lord tore the kingdom from him the church was split there was ten kingdoms given to another king and one kingdom given to Solomon's family which is Judea as we get near the end of the book it really splits into two different men one is Elijah the man of God and one is Ahab who's the king of Israel but he's a devil worshipper he's a murderer he's a vile man but Elijah is the one that the Lord uses to bring the church back to the sacrifice, back to the cross, back to the blood, and say, this is what saves you. Whereas Ahab continues to harden his heart. He has a moment of repentance, and even the Lord slows that destruction down in his life. But ultimately, Ahab digs his heels in, continues to follow the devil, continues going down the wrong path, and eventually he is killed. And the Lord is saying, which man are you going to be? Are you Are going to be Elijah, who does what is right in the eyes of the Lord, which is simply to trust Jesus? Or are you going to be like Ahab, which is to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, to reject the Lord God and follow after other gods? Um, our first song is Salvation Belongs to Our God and then that song Jesus I Think Upon Your Sacrifice and as we stand there's this verse here it says 
in Psalm 87, verse 7. As they make music, they will sing, all my fountains are in you. And as we were reading 2 Samuel, isn't we realize everything we need is in Jesus. Everything you absolutely need for life and for death is in the Lord. So as you sing, make that music in your heart and let him just continue to, to feed him, uh, feed you with his word, but feed you with his love, with his kindness um, as we sing together. If we can stand ready to sing. And we've been doing a series on praise in the morning, haven't it? And this chorus just says, honor, power, and strength be to our God forever and ever. We can always be sure that he's got power and help for us. So let's enjoy reminding each other and singing this to Jesus. Thank you that in your hands is our salvation, Lord. You have the power, the strength as the King of Kings to save. And we thank you, you save everyone who calls on your name. Lord, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Lord, such a sinful man. Lord, thank you for what we've heard already this evening. Lord, that you can change and you can save people. And Lord, we pray now as we just take some time to think about how you, you can do that, Lord. Please just touch our hearts as we carry on singing. Amen. I wonder if you've ever just uh, taken time to think about Jesus' sacrifice. When you do, it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing because you just end up asking that question, why? Why would God be willing to sacrifice himself for me and it's just an amazing answer isn't it because he loves you despite all the things we've said and done and as we go through in our minds isn't it Jesus pouring out his life pouring out his blood so we can be forgiven um, we can just stand there and wonder isn't it 
and be humbled and just thank him and praise him. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life. I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again. And once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside Once again I thank you, once again I pour out my life Now you are exalted to the highest place King of the heavens, where one day I'll bow. But for now, I marvel at this saving grace. I'm full of praise once again. I'm full of praise once again. And once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside Once again I thank you, once again I pour out my life Thank you for the cross Thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross, my friend. And once again I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you, once again I pour out my life. Lord, please help us never to forget your sacrifice. Thank you for Elijah's preaching in 1 Kings that we're going to read about that Preach the cross so strongly. Preach your sacrifice because that's our only hope. Lord, help us to always stay in that place where we stand and wonder at this saving grace. Lord, please help us as we carry on listening. Help us to hear your voice tonight, we pray. Amen. Yeah, we are so thankful, isn't it? And our prayer and our hope is that the Lord has already been starting to speak to your heart um, through the service. And Avon's going to come and do our Bible reading. And I'm sure the Lord will be speaking to you through that as well. And it's from 2 Samuel uh, chapter 19. 2 Samuel chapter 19. Good evening. The reading, as Brian's just said, is 2 Samuel chapter 19, verses 15, starting at now, and then 15 to 23, and then 34 to 37. Now the men of Judah had come to Gilgal to go out and meet the king and bring him across the Jordan. Shimei, son of Jira, the Benjamite, from Baharim, hurried down with the men of Judah to meet King David. With him were a thousand Benjamites, along with Ziba, the steward of Saul's household, and his fifteen sons and twenty servants. 
They rushed to the Jordan where the king was. They crossed the ford to take the king's household over and to do whatever he wished. When Shimei, son of Jira, crossed the Jordan, he fell prostrate before the king and said to him, May my lord not hold me guilty. Do not remember how your servant did wrong on the day my lord king left Jerusalem. May the king put it out of his mind, for I, your servant, know that I have sinned. But today I have come here as the first of the whole house of Joseph to come down and meet my lord the king. Then Abishai, son of Zurah, said, Shouldn't Semai be put to death for this? He cursed the Lord's anointed. David replied, What do you and I have in common, you sons of Zurah? This day you have become my adversaries. Should anyone be put to death in Israel today? Do I not know that today I am king over Israel? So the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. And the king promised him on oath. Then verses 34 to 37. But Barzillai answered the king, How many more years shall I live that I should go up to Jerusalem with the king? I am now 80 years old. Can I tell the difference between what is good and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats and drinks? Can I hear the voices of men and women singers? Why should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Your servant will cross over the Jordan with the king for a short distance. But why should the king reward me in this way? Let your servant return, that I may die in my own town near the tomb of my father and mother. But here is your servant, Kimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king. Do for him whatever pleases you. Thanks so much, Yvonne. Thank you for bearing with the names as well. <laughs> Let's pray before we look at that together. Father, we thank you for what we've already heard about Jesus this evening, and we pray as we hear more now that you would speak, that we would hear your voice, and Lord, that this might be a night when we all change to become more like Jesus. Lord, whatever stage we're at, we just pray you would speak to us. We thank you for your amazing love. Please help us now, we pray, for your glory's sake. Amen. Okay, is this on all right? I can hear? Yeah. Brilliant. I think we've all sort of been struck and we read in 1 and 2 Samuel how... It's just it's real life, isn't it? God doesn't go out of his way to hide stuff in the Bible, that everything's fine and perfect and, and happy. Um, and in doing that, what it shows us, isn't it, is Jesus is in control of all sorts of horrible situations, but can work them for good, can save people, build his church, and do incredible things in the end. I think that's an amazing thing. And this is another one of those parts of the Bible. Um, David, just to give a quick bit of background, David, who's king of the country, has been in Jerusalem, but he's been forced out by his son Absalom. And he's gone out and crossed the Kidron Valley, where he's been cursed and insulted. He's climbed up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he goes. And if you're thinking this is, sounds familiar, it's because it's the exact journey that Jesus took the night he was betrayed. And he went, of course, up the Mount of Olives, didn't he? Weeping and crying and in great distress. But David goes further. He goes past the stones at Gilgal. Remember we did that in Joshua? As he saw those on his way out of the country. And he crosses the Jordan 
and he's forced into the desert. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem for the first time, the crowds who shouted, Hosanna, save us, one second, just a couple of days later, were shouting, crucify him, weren't they? Choosing Barabbas over Jesus, cursing him, insulting Jesus. He was betrayed by Judas, who was so close to him, wasn't it? Betrayed with a kiss, and he was denied by Peter, one of his closest friends, and in fact, all the disciples were scattered. So you're going to see big parallels. Coming back to David, David's enemy, his own son, has been destroyed, and it's now time for him to come back as king, back to Jerusalem. But what will he find? What's he coming back to? Loads and loads of people come out to meet him, but how are they going to meet him? Jesus was rejected and despised, but now he's defeated sin and death and evil and hell and the devil, and he's reigning until all his enemies are put under his feet, the Bible says, and he is coming back. He's coming back. He can't be stopped. It's a day the Bible promises is going to happen. He's on his way back, even now. What is Jesus coming back to? Not everything goes right for David when he returns as king. We're going to see that. But when Jesus returns as king of the whole world, everything is going to be put right. In fact, the Bible says every mouth is going to be silenced. There won't be like any, that's not fair. He should have got a longer sentence. You don't know how he treated me all these years. None of that. Everyone's just going to be, that's right. That's fair. That's justice, true justice for the first time in the history of the world. But the question is this, are you ready to meet this returning king? That's the question this passage. Before he actually arrives back to rule, you need to go out to him. You need to meet him. But how will you meet him? What will he find? Remember in, I think it's Luke chapter 5, Jesus talks about that day and he says, will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he returns? Will he find you trusting him? Will he find you ready for when his kingdom comes on the earth in all its fullness? How have you gone out to meet our glorious risen King? Well, the first person to meet David, and I never know how to pronounce his name, I think Yvonne, did a good job, Shimei. Not the Welsh Shimei. Shimei, 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 however you say him. Okay? He is the first one to meet David. On his, a couple of chapters earlier, you can read it. As David was on his way out, persecuted, rejected, despised. Shimei was, or Shimei, he was, he was the one leading the cursing. If you read it there, he was awful. It was really wicked what he did. He basically followed David all the way along this valley, chucking dirt and stones and insults and curses, saying, I'm glad you're going. You're out, and I'm glad you're out. That's what we wanted. You are a man of blood. You've, you've spoiled all our lives. And he really believes it. He showers him with dirt, showers him with insults, throws curses on him. He looks down on David in his suffering. He takes pleasure in it. He's like, yes, it's about time this guy's gone. He should have been out a long time ago. Cursing him. And then Abishai I don't know, some likable rogues in the Bible up there. Abishai says, 
you should cut off his head. I know he's got an obsession with cutting off heads, Abishai. If you read him in the Bible, he's like, cut off his head. If anyone does anything wrong, cut his head off. And David's like, no, no, we're not going to do that. Um, Because in his suffering, David looks like Jesus. And I think Jesus, well, when other people insult you and curse you, and there's no truth in what they're saying, how do you react? Let's not say on the outside, on the inside, how do you react? oh, that's okay, because I deserve worse anyway in God's eyes. That's not how we react, if we're honest, is it? We hate it, don't we? We're desperate to justify ourselves, aren't we? And I can't listen to that anymore, because he's wrong, or she's wrong. I've got to say something. That's how we do it. But David doesn't do that. He has, he's very humble, and Jesus must be the one helping him to do that. And it reminds us of Jesus. In Isaiah 53, talking about Jesus, remember what it says there. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. As Jesus was led out to the cross, as he was nailed onto the cross, terrible things were said about him, weren't they? All sorts of curses and insults. People say, and I'm glad he's dying. I'm glad he's gone. They despised and rejected Jesus. They didn't recognize him as their king. And what did he do? He prayed. Not Father, curse them because they've got it coming. They deserve it. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That's amazing humility, isn't it? Jesus was silent, he was quiet, he allowed people to curse him. Romans 15, 3 says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Jesus allowed the sins and the insults of everyone who speaks against God to weigh him down, to come on him. That's amazing, isn't it? He was totally innocent, never done or said anything wrong, and yet he was willing for all the insults, all the sins of those who sin against God to to come on him, to fall on him, for him to be treated in that way. Isaiah 53 again says, He poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Treated like a criminal, wasn't he? Even though he'd done nothing wrong, he was willing to hang between two criminals, people who took people's lives away. Jesus had come to give life, and yet he chose to give up his own life, even though he was perfect, to save. He was willing to be counted with the worst sinners, to be treated, to be cursed, for the in, all the insults of history on God to fall on him, led to be slaughtered and didn't say a word. What an amazing king we have, isn't it? How humble Jesus is. How far he's willing to be mistreated. Why? To save you. To save you. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? So, back to chapter 19. Shimei, he's come out. Bear that in mind, how he saw David leave. Now he hears that David's coming back. And he comes out with a thousand Benjamites who are from Saul's tribe. David's arch enemy, his nemesis, if you like. A thousand men, an army, who were close to Saul. It says they rushed to cross over. And he's come out with Zeba and his 15 sons and... 20 servants, whatever it was. They've come out. Loads of them have come out. He's cursed David. He's thrown insults on David. He's chucked dirt on him, on his name. He's trodden him down and he's done all that sort of stuff. He said, you're pathetic. You're not what we need as a king. Get out. What's he come out to do now? He hears that David is on his way back. Well, there's been an incredible change in this man. Instead of throwing dirt and stones and insults, 
he throws himself at David. <laughs> not, not to like beat him, not like he leaps off the cliff at him to take him out, not that sort of thing. He throws himself on the floor, prostrate, on his face, in the dirt that he's thrown at David. And he pleads with him. He does not want what he's done to be remembered by David. You know, I think he's got some cheek, hasn't he? It's awful what he's done. It's terrible. He's like, he's wanted him dead. He's, he's, ch- he's totally trodden down his name. How could he? And there's Abishai, isn't there? He's there again. He wanted to cut his head off before. He's like, he deserves to die. What a reminder, isn't it? He deserves to die for this. And he does, doesn't he? That's the truth. He does. Shimei has cursed the king. He deserves to die. But he's pleading. Please don't remember what I've done. I know I've sinned. It's, it's horrible. Have you ever had that where you have that replay of something in your past life? Now he's watching David come back. He's remembering, isn't he, what he said before. His sin is horrible. It's grating at his conscience and he's like, oh, what did I do? What did I say? Why did I do that? And he just throws himself at David's mercy, doesn't he? He's like, please, don't, just don't remember. I don't, I don't want to remember it, but I, I have to remember it. But please don't you remember it. That's the main thing. And even though he has an accuser standing next to him saying, you should die, you should die, David turns to him and says some remarkable words, doesn't he? You shall not die. They're the same words. It was up on the RBT feedback video at the start. They're the same words that David heard from Jesus when he sinned, and he was worried about being judged. And Jesus says to him, even though you've sinned, you shall not die. Remember the lovely verse in Isaiah 43, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Have you ever thought about that? Could God remember your sins if he wanted to? Sorry, I know it's a bit like we're not going too deep on it. Could he though? He could, couldn't he? Because he's God. He could pull them up at any time he wanted and throw them in your face like you threw them in his face. But he chooses not to remember. That's an amazing thing. He puts them behind him. He takes them away as far as the east is from the west. And he says, I will not bring them up ever again. The devil brings them up. You bring them up. But Jesus doesn't once they're confessed and forgiven. And that's an amazing verse, isn't it? That Jesus says, I will remember your sins no more. Did he deserve to die? Yes. Is that what happened? No. Because David had mercy on him. Remember, the same thing happened to the sinful woman, isn't it, who anointed Jesus' feet. And people say, if Jesus knew what she'd done, he wouldn't let her touch him. Well, Jesus did know what she'd done. And he did let her touch him. In an amazing way. She sort of tied, as she washed her feet crying, she tied herself to Jesus with her hair almost and said, I belong to Jesus. So, you have a choice tonight. This is what Shimei is teaching us. You can throw dirt at Jesus or you can throw yourself at Jesus. If you're not a Christian tonight, your choice is already made. You've been throwing dirt insults and curses, you might think, no, I I haven't. But remember what made Jesus cry and upset him more than anything else was as he rode into Jerusalem, wasn't it, was seeing a whole city that he longed to gather to him that just simply said, no, we refuse to believe in you. That hurt the heart of Jesus more than anything, didn't it? He wept and wept and wept just because people said, no, I don't want to be a Christian. No, I don't want to trust you. That was like the worst insult, isn't it? Like spitting in his face, like cursing him, like throwing dirt on his name, isn't it? That is who I am. That's what Brian was saying, is that his heart and soul is tied up in this to come and rescue and save. 
And if you're not a Christian, you have lived in that way, throwing dirt on Jesus' name, pushing him out, pushing him away by your sin. Just by not wanting to trust in him, by wanting to live for yourself. And what's Jesus done all this time you've been living like that? He's been taking it. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? He's been taking it, and he's been taking it, and he's been taking it, and he's been letting it pile up all on him, and he's taken it all to the cross and given his life with all your insults and sins that you've tried to get rid of, you've tried to become a better person, you've tried to stop, you've tried to create new habits, you've tried to be religious, or you've tried to save yourself, you've looked all around the world to, for things to save you, and it hasn't worked, and all the time throwing curses at him, he can't be the way, he can't be the truth, he can't be the life, treading mud on his name, and all the time he's been holding out his hands to you, dying for you in your place to save you, let the way that Jesus has suffered for you change you tonight. Remember that man, that soldier who stood at the side of the cross? When he saw how Jesus died, he said those words to me, truly, this man, this man was the Son of God. Look how humbly God has been willing to take all of your sins and insults and curses and die for you in your place. Up till now, maybe you've caused Jesus a lot of pain, hurt and suffering, but he's taken it all for this moment tonight where he wants to save your soul forever. What amazing love. You can carry on throwing dirt and insults and curses by your life, but much better to throw yourself at Jesus. Because, you know, every single person in all of history who's thrown themselves at Jesus has been forgiven. Doesn't matter what sins they've done, doesn't matter what they've said, doesn't matter how far they've lived away from God up till this moment, if you throw yourself on Jesus, and I mean all of yourself, just throw yourself at him and say, Lord, I know I've sinned, but I'm desperate for you not to remember my sins. Because if you forgive me, then I'm truly forgiven. If you set me free from being a slave to sin, I'm truly set free. Remember the thief on the cross? Stopped hurling insults and curses, didn't he? And said, Jesus, remember me? Again, you might think he's got some cheek, hasn't he? This guy who's taken other people's lives and stolen. Jesus, remember me? When you come into kingdom, what did Jesus say? I'll think about it. Give me another couple of hours. Well, that's no good, is it? Because he's dying. He's thrown himself on Jesus with his last breath. Jesus says, today, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that your testimony if you're a Christian tonight? When it, whatever, however... Whenever, wherever it was, you threw yourself at Jesus, he saved you that moment. And yes, you should have died, but he had mercy on you and saved you. What an amazing king. We need to learn from Shammai. Next is, oh, before we go on to that, um, we can... And just a little aside, as, as Christians, we can throw dirt on Jesus' name as well. So we need to be careful of that. Uh, again, it was quoted in the RBT feedback, isn't it, that when David sinned, he caused non-Christians around to have an opportunity to throw insults at Jesus because of his behavior. So it is a massive responsibility, isn't it? But often what non-Christians think about Jesus is influenced by you. No pressure. <laughs> But with Jesus' help, isn't it? We can look like him. But there's many times when we've trodden Jesus' name down in front of others, isn't it? By the things we've said and done, we still need to throw ourselves on him as Christians and say, Jesus, please forgive me. Mephibosheth. Um, this is a little bit different. So Mephibosheth, we did, remember the other Sunday night, we got the table out and we carried to the table he was crippled in both feet. 
He didn't go with David when David was forced out. And his servant, who was meant to serve him, Ziba, totally betrayed him and lied and said Mephibosheth is staying in Jerusalem because he thinks, this is quoting, today the house of Israel will give me back my grandfather's kingdom. So Ziba comes and he's like, Mephibosheth ain't coming, David, because he thinks this is his opportunity to get back the kingdom that belongs to him. Now, this is again, you know, like Solomon. Solomon looks like Jesus at his best, but he's not Jesus. David just took Ziba's word for it and took all the land off Mephibosheth and gave it to Ziba. It was a lie. But, but, when you read, when David is coming back, Mephibosheth now does come, presumably carried or on a donkey or on a horse or camel or something, back. He can go, can't he? He can come and meet the king. So we're going to look at this in both ways. Because Mephibosheth's first answer is, Zeba betrayed me, which was true. Sorry for the pun, but it's a bit of a lame excuse, isn't it? That he gives. It really is, because surely he could have got someone else to saddle his donkey, so he could have gone with David. And I think, if we can look at it like this, that It's amazing, isn't it, what Jesus has done, that we've been crippled by a great fall, haven't we? We did did that the other week. But Jesus has saved us, lifted us up to God, given us a seat at his table. But sometimes I think we can be a bit complacent, isn't it? We're like, we get comfortable. I'm like, I love all the things I get as a Christian. I love all the grace. I love all the comfort. I love all the help. I love all the peace and the joy and everything like that. And yet when it comes to be joined to Jesus in public with his name when he's suffering, sometimes we can be quite backwards in that, can't we? Because we like the table. I'm not saying he was guilty of this, Mephibosheth, but I think there's a hint of that because David doesn't just give him all the land back. He only gives him half. So I think there's something like this going on here. But I think for our sake, isn't it, Sometimes our excuses are lame ones, aren't they? To say, I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to read. I'm not going to speak up for Jesus in work. I'm not going to mention anything to my neighbors because I can see what they think of him. And if I go with him, I'm going to suffer. And it's going to be too painful. Not saying he definitely did that. But I think there's a little bit of that there. There's definitely something of that in us, isn't there? That we can get a bit too comfortable and think, we get blessed with all of Jesus' stuff, don't we, and all of that he has. But how willing are we, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's hard, to suffer with him and for him? But in the end, I think Mephibosheth is justified, isn't he? Because when David comes back and sees him... What happens is he, ha- I don't know exactly what it means, he didn't look after his feet. You'll have to use your own imagination. Whether he, I don't know, we won't go too gruesome, but whether it's something to do with his toenails or I don't know, however he looked after. But basically the point is, he has been so upset since David left, he hasn't even looked after himself. Let's just leave it at that rather than going into detail. So basically what he's done is, and it's like that, he's like, I can't eat. When something that bad upsets you, he's like, I can't eat, I've mourned, I haven't shaved my beard, I haven't made myself look nice. All I wanted was David back, was the king to return. He's been in mourning, he's missed him. And when he sees David and David sees him, it's all put right, isn't it? And David offers him back half of the land and he says no. When he sees David, his heart is moved, and he's just like, no, I don't want any of that. Now that you're back, that's enough. Do you remember the Pharisees asked Jesus, Jesus, why don't your disciples fast? Why are they always eating and drinking? Whatever Jesus did, you notice that, whatever he did, he always got criticized for it, didn't he? If he ate and drank, he was drunk, you know, he broke the Sabbath, all these that he ate with tax collectors and sinners, they, 
you can always find a reason, even though he was perfect. Here comes another one. Why don't your disciples fast? Well, Jesus gave an amazing reason, didn't he? He said, when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast. In other words, when they don't have me here anymore, then they're going to fast. Then they're going to go without food because they don't have me here and they'll miss me and they'll want me. Now's the time to celebrate and rejoice because I'm here. They get to talk to me face to face. They get to eat and drink and listen to my teaching. But when I am back in heaven and I'm running the church from there, they won't have that anymore. Then they'll fast. Isn't, it? isn't that the same now? That we should be in that position, isn't it? Like Mary, they've taken my master away and I don't know where they've put him. That should be our reaction, isn't it? When Jesus feels far away, it's like, where's he gone? I can't live without him. I can't, I can't do anything. I can't breathe. I can't think properly. I can't speak properly. I don't know how to feel anymore until I've got him back. And that's Mephibosheth setting that example, how we should long for Jesus, our Savior, isn't it? When we don't know his presence, when we feel far away. And it should be him that we long for. Remember the old hymn, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. If Mephibosheth knew it, that's what he was singing that day, wasn't it? I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. That was Mephibosheth, wasn't it? Through David. And that should be us. Remember the end of Revelation? Jesus says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Jesus says, I'm coming back soon. Amen, let it be so. Come, Lord Jesus. That's the reply of the church, isn't it? We've been waiting for this moment. It's not proper full life until you come back. We don't, new heavens and new earth is amazing. No more crying is amazing. A new body is amazing. No more frustration, depression, anxiety, worry, death. All that's amazing, but it's you that we want. Because you're the one who brings all that to us. That's what we be longing for, longing for Jesus. So if Shammai is a guy who's not a Christian turning to be one as Jesus comes back, Mephibosheth is one and is a mixture of one and who feels all sorts of different things like us. But in the end, his longing is for the returning king. Bazillai is an older Christian. He's been faithful and loving in the past. If, I, I love the way it describes. So when David's out in the middle of the desert, I don't know how they used to do this, but when David's out in the middle of the desert, he brings beds. <laughs> he brings like this portable palace campsite thing with beds, refreshments, food. I don't know how he did it. He must have been a very wealthy man, mustn't he? And for David's, all of David's people that are with him. So he'd been a massive comfort and help to David when he was out. And now David's coming back. This old man, he's 80 years old. He's traveled on a long journey. He's traveled a long way. But he still wants to be with the king. He still wants to follow the king as he comes back to his throne. He wants to cross the Jordan and send David on his way. And David offers him something amazing, doesn't he? A place in the palace Come and live with me. Come and enjoy everything. You've been such a faithful servant. And what an answer, isn't it? I'm not going to say he basically says I'm past it. But he says, what he's saying is, isn't it? I can't, I can't serve like I used to serve. I just can't. I'm too old. I, I can't see properly. I can't hear properly. I don't get all the new things that are going on. That's what he said. I don't understand it all. But he's not bitter, is he, as an older Christian? He's not like, I should still be at the forefront. He is happy now, isn't he? He's happy. He is happy to just have whatever Jesus has chosen to give in him because he knows he's got an eternal home waiting for him. And that's much better. Better by far, like Paul says, isn't it? 
He says, I can go on for a little while, but my time to go home is coming soon. I've been on a long journey, but I'm old and I'm tired. I can't do as much, and I long to be home. I just want to say to the older Christians here this evening, we love you as a church. Please come on with us a little bit longer. I know it's up to Jesus, and he's numbered our days. And I know you can't see as well or hear as well or serve physically like you used to be able to, but we need you, and we love you, and we need you to shine like however you say his name, Buzzilai. Be one of those. Don't be a bitter older Christian. Be a Buzzilai. Be someone who shines for Jesus. And what does he do? His longing is for a younger Christian to go on with the king. What a great longing, isn't it? Take this young guy. Bless him. Give him everything that should have been mine. Let him have it. He can enjoy it. He can use it. Let him have all the gifts. He can use, he can serve you much better than me. Our time to go home with Jesus will come. But don't we want our children to be going on with him in this church and young people? Not to be bitter that maybe our time is coming to an end here, but looking with hope through their eyes and seeing that Jesus' church carries on. Remember what John says in 3 John, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. He doesn't mean his physical children. He means all the people he's preached to who've trusted in Jesus. He says, out of everything, I have no greater joy than to see them walking with Jesus. As an older Christian, is that what gives you the most joy in church? Apart from Jesus, obviously. Please pray for the young people. Please talk to them. I know they use a different language, and I know they're into different stuff. But you've got so much to share with them before you go home. And if you're a young Christian, if Jesus spares you, you're going to be one of the older Christians one day. So be patient with them and listen, because they've been through everything you're going to have to face and more. And Jesus, they're still walking with Jesus. And that's a miracle. It's amazing. Very finely to finish. All these people refresh David on his way to returning. And if you live like them, you will refresh and bring comfort to Jesus. Isn't that an amazing thing? That you could actually do that with his help. But we said, not everything goes right. A massive argument comes up. Sheba blows his trumpet. And all of Israel desert David again. What is going on? You're like, oh, isn't there ever a good ending in the Bible, isn't it? It's like these three amazing things, and then it just all goes wrong again, and we're back to square one. That's how it feels. But you see, before Jesus comes back, there's always going to be Sheba's. And basically, what did he do? He blew his own trumpet. That's what he did. How many people are there who love blowing their own trumpet, saying, follow me? They'll always be around, always until Jesus returns. But what happened? Well, Abishai finally got his wish. A head gets thrown over a city wall, and it puts an end to the war. You might think, oh, that's not a good ending, is it? That's a gruesome ending. But the point is, it's a very wise woman who saves loads of people's lives by cutting that head off and throwing it over the wall. The devil is always going to be a troublemaker blowing his own trumpet and pulling people away from Jesus after him. If we're to be like a wise, that wise woman, a wise city as a church, we need to not let him live in our hearts. Chuck his head back over. We don't want you here. That should be our attitude as a church. We have a great king coming, don't we? Returning for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just pray you'd help us to learn from all of these characters in the Bible. Thank you we see ourselves in them, Lord, because no one really changes over thousands of years. Lord, we're still the same people, have the same hearts, and you are still the same Savior. 
And we thank you, Jesus. Help us like Shimei to be humble and to ask for your forgiveness. Help us to be like Mephibosheth and to long for your return. Help us to be like Barzillai, Lord, and to pray for the younger generation coming through, Lord, that they would walk with you. Help us not to be troublemakers like Sheba and to copy the devil, but Lord, help us to be that wise woman in that city, resisting the devil so he flees from us. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing love and help, for your glory's sake. Amen. We're going to sing our last song. And hopefully after hearing what Jesus has done, your heart will be filled with thankfulness. And that's what our last song talks about. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again. And this verse in 2 Thessalonians, let me just read it first before we raise our hands. It says this, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's raise our hands together. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, and God bless you.